My name is Brock, and this is the Dungeon Master's Toolkit Podcast. On today's episode, I talk to Tanya from Scotland. We start off talking by the amount of games Tanya has played. There are a ton and a lot of indie games, especially. And I tried to get all of the links in the description, but I couldn't quite find all of them. We also talked about game design and side quest and zine quest, which are two kind of crowdfunding platforms for getting zines out there for smaller publishers or for indies. We talk a bit about Tanya's design philosophy and inspiration. We also go into some tips for indie publishing and just some of the resources involved there, as well as some playtesting tips. I'm sure I've missed something, but we had a really good and long conversation and we talked about a lot of things. A couple announcements before we get into the episode. If you remember, today is the last day to submit your contest entry for your creature. So if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and do that. We only have seven submissions as of Thursday night. So that means your chances of winning are pretty good. So go in, uh, just throw together a creature quick and add it to the list. If you are looking to get interviewed or just hang out and chat, be sure to join our Discord server because it's the easiest way to interact directly with me and get notified when we have new interview opportunities. So check that out. And please help our little community grow by sharing, liking, and interacting with the episodes on whichever platform you're on. And with that, let's get into the episode. Welcome, everybody. I have Tanya here with me. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you. Wel- thank you for welcoming me. Hello. Um, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in tabletop role-playing games? Yeah, well, um, so my name's Tanya Floker. I've been gaming now for 30-plus years. Um, I started, uh, I don't know, like, I guess, like, there's a, a kind of stereotype that if you're over in the US, you started with D&D. And if you're over in the UK, you started with uh, either uh, fighting fantasy books or Warhammer. Okay, and that's kind of kind of true with myself, at least. Um, like even like when I was really young, maybe seven, eight, I was re- reading these choose what choose your own adventure fighting fantasy books. And one day I was at my granny's house, uh, where we flat, and. My cousin came round, my big cousin had came round, and we had this uh, new, like, chunkier, bigger fighting fantasy book. It was called Dungeoneer, and it was advanced fighting fantasy, and you had to play it with more than one person. So instead of it being a solo game book, he, like, opened it up, and he got me to make a character, and I had to tell him what I was doing, and we had to play it that way. And I, I fell in love with it immediately. I, I borrowed his copy of that. It's the, the advanced fighting fantasy sort of series of books. And I picked that up. I got in a lot of trouble because I, the sort of like blank character sheet that was inside it, I filled it in. And <laughs> age nine, I uh, should have known better. And from there, uh, I've just been, everything just sort of carried on building from there. Uh, I went on from trying out Advanced Fighting Fantasy onto Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And I, my cousin was also into sort of the Blood Bowl and War Games side of things with, with uh, Games Workshop. So I started getting interested in those. Uh, and then, like, there were two big board game releases. They, and one of them, Hero Quest, has had a sort of re release recently. And but the one that I got from one of my birthdays was Space Crusade, and it was just like this massive box filled with miniatures, and it was more board game, but like it had the same sort of seeds that had been planted before going on that we were all playing out the uh, characters and squads, and it had one person playing the 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 enemy, the sort of monsters, and that carried on and carried on, and so ah. Uh, 
so yeah that basically snowballed into when i got to high school me uh there's a, a sort of games club that would drop. I think it was a Tuesday after school and a Friday lunchtime and I just started going along to that and it, it hasn't stopped since. So, so you that's a continuing kind of game session then? Yeah well no well what happened there is um I turned up and it was like most of the games being played were board games so it was Risk and Diplomacy were the two most popular games there. There was a Blood Bowl League going on, and uh, the, there was someone. So, my fre- a friend of mine, Dylan, picked up secondhand the AD and D first edition books from a, a local charity shop, and so I think that was the third third game. The first game I ever played was Advanced Fighting Fantasy. The second one was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And the third one was Advanced fight, uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And I was less fond of that compared with the other two. And so then I started running my own ad, uh, Advanced Fighting Fantasy game, but I'd hacked it to be a Warhammer 40,000 roleplay game with all my pals. And so I ran that for a little bit. And then that when that petered out, there was a... We, we sort of just played all different games. So I was playing like uh, Necromunda got released a few years into that. And we played that loads, but we played it in a very narrative focused way. So narrative skirmish games became a whole thing that we all enjoyed. And we all played Blood Bowl like in, in a really sort of fast and loose way. Um, and so, yeah, it, it had like. Even the the board games and role play, uh, the board games and the the war games that we were playing, all had a little bit of this role play element to them. And yeah, so uh, I'd help I'd help set up and take down the club each time, and uh, I would go along to that for like six years of high school, and then uh, then I went off to university, and. Uh, turned up at the uni games club it was uh a pan like it, when i turned up it was didn't have a like i was told that the, the the person running it was handing it on but there wasn't anyone to take over and so i just picked it up and started running the uni games club pretty much after that's awesome <laughs> it, it ran itself for a while and it had some other people involved but then uh yeah, so I just uh, once I hit that though, I just I'd already played a bunch of other games at high school. Uh, a, a sort of older friend who'd left school was getting married and just uh, handed out. He, he was moving house and so couldn't fit all his games uh, into the place, and he gave away all his role play games apart from a few few choice books he wanted to keep for himself. And so I played quite a lot of different games, and then. Uh, yeah, before like I was really into the first edition of Legend of the Five Rings. I remember that being a big hit. And I, oh yeah, I'd started. If this is at high school still, uh, I would sneak. So I was living in a small town called Perth, um, and I would like just go off without really telling my parents to get the uh, like go with the goths uh, in this sort of like crazy car ride for about 60 miles to another small town called Livingston, where there was a, a live-action role-play game of Vampire the Masquerade. So I'd go, go play Daughter of Twilight, which was... Uh, it was the first live-action role-play game I ever, I ever sort of played, and I keep a copy of the rulebook to remind me to never run a game like that ever in my life. It wasn't wasn't the best, but it was great at the time. So yeah, <laughs> you've had quite the a wide variety of games over the years that you've played. Yeah, well, I, I sort of was, I, I was a sort of teenager when the the sort of the world of darkness um, boom happened, and loads of people were flooding into the hobby. But I'd been in the sort of war game element of the hobby before that as a, a kid. I was sort of like the 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 brat hanging about and then i was sort of like the spotty teen hanging about and then i was 
Uh, and then, like, when I got to high school, uh, pardon me, when I got to university, I'd already been running the high school club. I'd already been involved with, like, live action role play stuff. Um, I'd already been been sort of like, I'd been running games at that point for years. So um, I just I just kept going and snowballing from there. Played lots more games. The first first game I played when I hit uh, university is I played in a game of RuneQuest set in Glorantha, which I hadn't uh, hit up to that point. And some of the old guard, uh, basically when you turned up at the club, the old guard would sit you down at the table and you'd roll up your character and have a go. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, that's carried on from there. So, um, what uh, what is your like current? Do you have like a current system that you specifically play, or do you still continue to play a wide variety of systems? Um, these days, I would say I'm mostly focused in the sort of like what what gets classed as the indie game sort of scene. Um, I really like story games, things with a real narrative focus. Um, I kind of try to dip my toe into the the old school Renaissance, the OSR a little, but um, it's it like let's think of my my most recent sort of gaming gaming has been. Um, well, I'm currently uh, getting together for a, a forged in the dark game called A State, which has just been uh, released. Or, well, it's just been funded on Kickstarter recently, and I'm actually um, really, really fortunate to have been asked to to put a little bit of uh, writing towards the final product. Not not too much, but uh, I was really chuffed to have been sort of asked out the blue. Um, so I've been playing recently. Uh, you see, we've got a, a local games club. I'm in Edinburgh in Scotland. And we've got a local, it's called Edinburgh Indie Gamers. And so we do two meetups uh, every month where we just play a one shot, like one shot zero prep games. So we do a lot, lot up, so a lot of it small press and indie, indie focused games. I'm trying to think back on, like, I think we played, I tried out the Black Hack recently, which is like an OSR game, sort of D&D clone thing. Um, what else did I have I played? Uh, we played The Gardener is Dead, which is by a local designer in Kijinj. Um, and it's sort of like a a bit of a, a sort of it's a bit like The Quiet Year, if you know that game at all. You know, I've actually seen people talking about it recently on the server, but I haven't actually looked into it. Okay, well, quite. The, the Quiet Year is a bit about is about uh, the Quiet Year and a, a sort of like after the apocalypse community as it's getting by, but a sort of like surviving community, or maybe hopefully is. Uh, the Gardener is Dead is about uh, a sort of um, spooky garden where the, a new gardener has turned up after the old one has died, and they find a letter from their predecessor and. You spend a lot of time at the start creating uh, the sort of like the plant. You use sort of uh, a deck of cards to to sort of give prompts, and then use those prompts to like create items and relationships and boast. And it it becomes this sort of like spooky garden. Sort of our, our game was went quite surreal and quite sort of deep into this uh, character who'd given up being an emergency room doctor, but. Um, Every game is slightly different because it, it's a, a there's not a GM it's a, a group uh, a group sort of storytelling experience. Um, what else did we? I played a a a, lo- a week sort of a, a mid mid length campaign of the Great American Witch. Um, we played Fall of Magic. Uh, yeah, so just loads of games. I try I try everything out if I could get the time for it, but. Uh, yeah, that's that's my recent plays, uh, and I design my own games and I, I sort of uh, run them for for my friends. The good thing about having a, a sort of like specifically small press and indie games focused club is that um, 
there's plenty of places to go play all the the sort of like big big like 30 40 50 pound book games okay you can you can go to any any games club you can ask on any looking for gamers groups uh and and you'll get people who want to play like either the dragon game or shadow run or like even warhammer fantasy role play or something um but having a, a group where it's like who who wants to try out this sort of like uh maybe maybe niche experience or something that just hasn't got the same uh it's it's just sort of like a small creator owned project that hasn't had the big advertising oomph or or sort of like cultural weight behind it. And it's really great. Um I've tried out so many games just being involved with that. I assume that helps you run and design games and stuff as well too then, right? Because you're getting to experience just such a large variety of different ways of handling things. Oh yeah, definitely. Like trying out different games i think for anyone if that wants to to maybe try design a game or even for running games trying out like what the, the games that are considered the best of each type of game like each type of design um it really gives you an appreciation for what you want to then do when you sit down to run a game so like i'd i'd say to everyone like even if you're you're sort of like your main group are just playing Dungeons and Dragons or something, or, or something pretty mainstream. Like, go out and and see what a, what's considered like one of the best like of the story game indie game crops. Like, and what's the best OSR games? Like, go grab a game of Fiasco somewhere and do it with people that kind of know the game, so you know you're getting a good experience with it and a fair you have a fair sort of go at it. Um, Go grab a game of uh like Troika. Give that a shot. See see what what it teaches you about game design, teaches you about running games and even about playing games. And then like you can always take the the bits of the experiences that you like and and try them out uh yourself. That's like why I like interviewing all of these dungeon masters because I don't have time to go play everything, so I, I can at least get secondhand information from people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's. I'll, I absolutely love your show here. Um, for that reason, it's like hearing people having different takes and coming from different backgrounds. Like some folks are just like I've been like I've been uh, like doing D and D for like a few months, and this is what I think and where I'm coming from is so different from where I'm coming from. I can learn a lot from that. Well, good. I, the show is doing its job then, so that's good. Can we talk about some of the projects that you have worked on then, or the games that you've designed? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm, I mentioned I'm doing a bit of freelance writing for A State, um, which is just being finalized exactly what I'm going to be writing there. And so really looking forward to that. That's with Handiwork Games which is uh, owned by John Hodgson, who is living out in Falkirk. And that's where the, he's based at the moment. And John has been a uh, like long-term, long-term sort of support of the, the indie game scene as well. It's about 10 years ago, maybe a bit longer now, there was a sort of group of designers mainly based in Scotland, but across Britain that called themselves the Collective Endeavour. And Collective Endeavour sort of look to um, help one another and help other designers get get their vision into print in the best way possible. And John was part of that. So he's since went on to form his own little company. And, and he's he's like a, an amazing artist and uh, an amazing game designer as well. And so I'm really chuffed to be working on something that he's he's helping to put. And the game A State actually was sort of like a a, a sort of cult favorite of my own, of, of mine from going back to when it was released in the early two thousands. It was uh, designed by another local designer, Malcolm Craig, and uh, the the system never seemed to marry up with the potential of the background, and so 
at getting a second crack of the whip and a new edition that's going to be forged in the dark. So very heavily based on Blades in the Dark, but with a far more sort of hopeful and sort of like uh, hoping. It, I, I always think of it, and this isn't how they, they describe it, but I always got the impression when I played it that it felt like it, we were trapped in this sort of like a diesel punk world where the ruling class had access to nanotech, but we were trying to struggle towards it being like a, a solar punk world, the sort of like transform society and transform the social relations, just r around about where your 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 plucky characters, the, your troublemakers, are are sort of acting and try and try and make it a better place. And so, I'm really chuffed to be working on that at the moment. Um, I've got a whole bunch of games actually designed and play tested and ready to go and it's it's just a matter of time for me releasing them so in november i'm going to be doing uh well first up uh in a, uh, later this month i'm going to be releasing uh a fanzine for uh, another local local sort of local legend slay industries so it's a sort of uh, it, it's a game that came out of Glasgow in the, the mid-late 90s and I have a lot of fondness, especially for the background and the sort of ideas that it was a, it was a commentary on Thatcherism and the, the sort of like uh, the greed and the, the corruption and it isn't even corruption, it's how it's meant to be, isn't it? So the sort of like... Uh, the the ideals of that time and how they've shaped society and so i like i'm putting together a little fanzine with lots of sort of short stories and interviews and uh no rules or, or mechanics or game material in that so so much as a, a sort of flavor piece by by the fan community so i'm going to put that out uh, i'm taking it to kickstarter this month and then i'll have it produced and, and printed the month after and then in November, that's where I was going. I've got uh, there's going to be a, a group of designers, uh, a large group of us, all trying to do a, a similar sort of crowdfunding event uh, to Zine Quest. So every February on on Kickstarter, they run a Zine Quest promotion where you run a a project that lasts the, the campaign that runs for up to two weeks. And it will produce a zine-sized uh, offering, like a game or or something related to games, like a module or something. And so, a lot we realised that a lot of us sort of smaller games designers were having to wait for that little one-month window to release stuff, so it would get enough exposure to make it worthwhile. And uh, yeah, so the the idea was born. Uh, to, to actually uh, try and do something similar but at a different time of year. So it was started by Mark Strott, uh, and they came up with this idea that we could just have our own event, but it wouldn't be limited to just Kickstarter. We could use it on all different platforms, and that we could have a, a, set, a sort of main website where anyone participating would have their project promoted, and everyone that was taking part would would promote the, the fact we're doing it and we'll call it side quest. So you've got zine quests going on and the word play on that, obviously, side quest. Um, so I've got a little zine size game called Tiny Spaceship that's going to come out. And it's a, a little diceless game, uh, GMless. It's for single sessions that go between one and a half and two and a half hours. And it, it sort of gives a, a sort of whimsical, cutesy, uh, spaceship exploring Earth and and coming across troubles and then overcoming them sort of feel. So it's a bit like the the role the role play game for batteries not included or inner space or or sort of like family friendly films in that sort of vein. It's pretty cool. Um, how does the how does the GMless piece of that game work? Okay, so there are different 
uh, roles that you you pick. Uh, some some one player plays the the titular spacecraft, and other players uh, pick troubles that uh, that it'll, the spacecraft will face uh, as it explores Earth. And then each each of them has a different sort of agenda set. So I've I've sort of lifted this heavily from uh, Grima Skew uh, by Avery Alder, um, and also from. Uh, another game called Legally Blonde, um, it's sort of like uh, based on the sort of like Legally Blonde movies, and that's by Martin Narukar. And so Martin's actually helped me a little bit with feedback on on Tiny Spaceship. And so you've got sort of the bounds for the the conversation, the bounds for narration are set for each of you, and it tells you when to engage the sort of rules mechanics and then based on how players decide to 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 engage those mechanics it then tells you what what sort of narration has to occur so it's a very very stripped down but very much in the, the sort of like uh the conversation loop that's uh that's given in sort of powered by the apocalypse and no dice no masters games so you kind of have like triggers as to like when this thing happens, then here's your rules yeah. for how to handle that. Yeah, yeah. You, you 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 will narrate until you want reach one of these sort of uh like cross points, and that those cross points will have to occur because of the the sort of that the, the sort of uh, mandates that you've been given in your roles, and when it does, there's some token exchange, there's some discussion, and then based on which outcome occurs, it then gives prompts for how to continue the narrative from there. Sure. So and... you're kind of guiding the players to have a, a conversation in a way that it, it's going to trigger other things from other people. Yeah, and, and it's not in a sort of like... It isn't like you have to... like. Every time I've ran it, it's been a very different story, but it's all been in that same sort of every game. I've never had a game sort of not not fit within that sort of like like parental guidance, PG film, sort of like family film sort of feel to it. Um, but they've all been very different. One was a sort of like about this cutesy little robot that had to nano robot that had to go into someone's body to help them and another one was about uh a spaceship uh it's actually a magical little craft that it that was had uh, little pixies flying it that it came in and it had to deal with uh a weather front that was sentient and uh someone a greedy uh ufo uh spotter and so every every game's been different, but they all have the same sort of uh, sort of whimsy to them, which I love. Um, so that one's a, that one's just my sort of lovely whimsical game. Uh, but then I've got like, as I say, I've got about a half dozen other games in in different different stages of being laid out or or play tested at the moment. So yeah. That's that's the things that are on the horizon at the moment in terms of near near horizon stuff. Um, then beyond that, it's I've got a game called Be Seeing You, which takes a lot of its uh, cues from the 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 sixties show The Prisoner. I don't know if you know it at all. I'm not familiar. No. Okay, so it's a like British sort of surreal science fiction spy thriller type type thing with Patrick McGoon and he is he plays the, the the main character who's only known by their number number six uh, and every week in the show there's a new number two uh, and he's been taken to who's in charge of a place called the village where he's been kidnapped to and he's trying to figure out what the village is how to escape it like it's a like a small surveillance society and so I've taken ideas from that and I, I want to do sort of a commentary on uh modern day surveillance upon personal and collective liberty and also talking about the 
the hostile environment laws in the UK, which are basically was started by the Labour Party and then ramped up by the both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats and and sort of quietly supported by any other parliamentary parties here, um, despite despite some public public chat otherwise and when it comes to actually voting for things they're, they're normally supportive of it and it's basically for migrants and refugees coming to the uk um the hostile environment is is what they are to find according to the laws being put in place so uh there's been a there's been a lot of like uh community resistance neighborhood resistance to these laws so what happened is that when they first brought them in um they started this is going back 10 12 maybe 14 years now they started doing dawn raids on families so the home office would turn up at people who, like migrants and, and and refugees and asylum seekers would turn up at families doors at four or five in the morning and like bash their doors in and snatch them to detention centres. And so uh, anti-raids networks formed up uh, to, to tackle that. And a lot of people would uh, track the vans that were undertaking these actions and try and stop them, uh, sabotage them, uh, chain themselves to the gates of the compounds where they would keep the, the vehicles so that they couldn't get the vehicles out for the day. Um, build tripods and chain themselves at the top of tri like metal tripods that the police would have to spend all day dismantling to get get the vans out. Um, and so, just that sort of my so what I could see of that and the involvement of that, like people would like sit on on vans or like most recently in Glasgow, uh, someone went underneath a van and wrapped themselves around. The, the axles of a van to stop it moving and then texted everyone they could and those people then texted everyone they could until it absolutely filled up all the streets surrounding this van and they had to let the people go and so that kind of act of resistance and uh sort of uh people taking direct action collectively to to change society for the better that that's something I want to sort of look at in that and also look at the 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 ramifications of what happens if you let these sorts of uh structural systems remain unchallenged. So yeah, that's that's a, a, a tiny spaceship's my cheery game and be seeing you is is my not so cheery game. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a pretty deep um inspiration you got there but definitely uh interesting to be able to use a game to explore some of those concepts oh yeah yeah i uh, like my personal politics come from a uh, uh, an anarchist communist perspective and i think every single one of the games i design um everything that i try and put down it isn't like I, I'm not like writing political thesis or anything. I don't think anyone would. I, 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 I hope no one sits down with my games and thinks that it's they're preaching, but they all have some of the the core ideas from that in them. Like I, I want, I want to see like my art reflect, like help prefigure and help people imagine a world that could be, or to see the problems of the world. That are there today and, and maybe think about them and work out ways for themselves so that we can collectively overcome them. Uh, so yeah, that 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 sort of rolls on to that's a, a theme through all my game my game sort of design is that I, I want to sort of uh, put a critical eye on uh, the hegemonic powers of the world and I want to to sort of look at ways in which we can promote uh, a world with sort of uh, of mutual aid and and solidarity and of like building bonds of free association between one another. Yeah, that is super cool. 
<laughs> no, not, not, not like, you know, those small things. No. <laughs> like, just some, some, some small little things. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's cool to see your passion, too, for, you know, taking kind of your beliefs and the things that you enjoy and then trying to also you know work that into the the projects and stuff that you do yeah i think my my single like one of my single biggest inspirations for this is ursula Le Guin. um her writing on on sort of how, how how her essays on how our art how the things that we write even if we don't realize it even if we don't want them to be are inherently political that they they have a message, even if it, the message in them is just supportive of the status quo. And so it is very important. I, I take her call that it's important when we sit down to write to, to understand that and then to write with purpose. I think that's really important. And uh, yeah, I hope... But I also hope the games I'm playing, uh, like like her books, I enjoy reading her books. I don't feel like I'm being preached to in them. And uh, same with, like, I love Michael Moorcock's literature, and I, I don't think um, I'm being preached to when I sit and read one of one of his sort of uh, more pulpy novels. And, uh, yeah, and, and that's, those are sort of, like, two like anarchist writers that obviously influenced me when I was younger and, and now when I'm coming to write I, I sort of like find myself thinking back on quite a lot or or reading more from. Um and so back a little bit on your tiny spaceship one. So you said that yeah. um that is getting released with the side quest yeah. project. Yeah yeah so if if folks go to uh i think it's uh sidequest.info there's loads of designers releasing stuff and there's more being added every day uh and that will have a list of everyone that's taking part and it's all these sort of zine sized games and modules and adventures and, and sort of game related materials uh and then we're going to try and crowdfund them over the course of november like and see how it goes. And so what does it take to get somebody's own project onto SideQuest? Um, you have to agree that you're not going to write anything that's bigoted, etc. Um, like nothing racist, nothing homophobic, etc, 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 nothing ableist. Um, that you have to you agree that on any project promotion that you'll either mention SideQuest or add the SideQuest logo and that you agree that as well as promoting your own project that you're going to prom promote SideQuest and the other projects involved. So like I'm I'm mentioning my game here and I'm also mentioning the fact it's part of SideQuest so it's not not too big and that there's a, a physical product involved and that it should be if not a zine exactly it should be sort of of a similar nature something zine sized or, or zine like small magazine related and then how does the how does the like crowdfunding piece of that work is it like to try to fund all of the projects so that they can get printed or what kind of is the goal there uh, the goal is to get people uh like especially folks who've never uh put their work into print trying to get their their work printed so it's uh, you, everyone that's taking part will run uh, a maximum ca like fundraising campaign of two weeks and we'll just start promoting it and the more people are involved the bigger our reach becomes so if yeah it, there's been quite a lot today was the day we actually announced publicly announced that the project is opening up and and starting and so for the next wee while we'll it'll be a bit slower as we just get getting involved and then once november 1st hits we'll see how it goes and we we're really hoping that every project that takes part can get funded uh, and get comfortably funded yeah that's really cool i just went to the sidequest.info and i do see that your tiny spaceship is on the front page there so oh, awesome nice <laughs> <laughs> Help, helps helps to be an early early uptaker i guess <laughs> Um, but also, I, I just love the idea that, like, 
I've I've got actually got although I've not done lots of games publishing, uh, I've sort of released a, a few fanzines and and uh, with Edinburgh Indie Gamers, we released a a zine earlier in the year uh, as part of Zine Quest uh, this year. Um, but this this will be my first time taking one of my own games and putting it into print. But I love the idea that the skills that I've got, I've I've been involved with like zine distros and and anarchist publishing for for years, and I, I love the idea that that I've got like all the perfect skills to pass on to people and give advice, and that at the same time there's other people who are involved that are far better like graphic design and layout, or that know font combinations that work, or have advice about which printers to go to like all sorts of collective advice there that someone coming into this that's maybe oh i've got that maybe got an idea maybe wrote down their notes maybe even play tested it with their friends but they, they're like how would i actually get this into pu like printed they may be looking at books on their shelves that are big hardbacks and thinking well this isn't one of those or i'd have to work so much more to make this into uh, a 200 page 300 page game maybe they don't have to maybe you can just have a, a 50 60 70 30 20 10 page game that fits in a, a small like small a a5 theme a6 theme something like that and it can go out into the world and it can be a, a little success and it can be something you can sit back and be really happy with and proud of and feel like oh, it's, and it's something that you 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 did and you did collectively with others it, it just goes to show that you can you can get these things out there it isn't you don't have to wait for a big publisher to pick you up and and you never know it might get get some eyes on your work and you might develop it further and you'll come back with a revised edition in a year or two and then maybe that is the bigger thing that you want it to be maybe not yeah, it's just kind of that like first exposure, first just get get something done. And one of the things that I've always right that I've found is that a lot of times um you don't really know how to do something until you've done it once. Um and and in this case you're getting people, you know, past the design phase and into the like publishing phase. Mm -hmm. And 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 all also giving them confidence that their design is worth putting out. Right. And, and yeah, I, I think that's super cool to have a, just a way to get through that, that initial step, because then, like you said, for a second edition or a revised edition or something, you're just going to have so much more knowledge on just mm -hmm. the whole process and, yeah. you know, things that you may need to do up front ahead of time or sooner, you know, in your design process or whatever, mm -hmm. having gone through the steps once and having that help to get through it, I think is huge. Yeah, and and learning not just from your own mistakes, which I've had mine, others will have theirs, but learning from everybody's collective knowledge is just great. Yeah, it's, it's I, I just as soon as like the the sort of there's a Discord server that the that this is sort of bubbled up from. Um, it's the the Zine Zine Creators Workshop, and that formed up just before Zine Quest this year um because there wasn't really while zine quest was taking place the sort of designers weren't talking to one another as easily like conversations were going on across loads of different places loads of servers twitter facebook what have you and so having this sort of place where we can all share our best practices been amazing yeah that's got to be super helpful to just come in so is, is that a public server then that's available <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's um if you if you do a search even on if you go to Twitter and search hashtag sidequest twenty twenty one, uh I think one of the posts there you'll find will will talk about the, the server. I think we also got some coverage today from Dicebreaker and from Geek Native and a few other uh sort of RPG news sites. And I think one or two of them might mention it as well. Oh, I'm going to have to... Oh, yep, yeah, Dicebreakers has a... Yeah. There's at least an article. 
yeah, that's it. And it, I don't know if one of them mentions it, or if you have to do a little bit of searching, but um, even if you just find anyone that's involved with with it, or go to the, the SideQuest website, message from there, there's a little little uh, contact section, and um, someone will get you on it. It's great. That is really cool. I'm going to have to do a little bit more research into that, because I would like to you know, work because I have, you know, a handful of things that I'm always kind of constantly working on, but just not gotten, not to a point where I would be ready to publish anything. But, you know, mm-hmm. at some point, I would like to have something published. So this might be a resources for me that I can use. So yeah, oh, that'd be amazing. And like, if you've got anything that even works a bit at the table, like, it's something to I it's a bit like um, the advice in, in games design is like, some people try and design a whole the whole two two hundred three hundred page game before they play test, and that's the wrong way around. As soon as you've got the smallest amount to play test, that's when you should that's when you should get playing. And it's almost like once you've got the the, the sort of like the actual structure of the game and a game that works, that's when you should try and maybe get it out there, even if it's just putting it out on a PDF or putting it up on Itch or like sending it about places like that's a, as soon as you've got a game that can be played and handed to others like let's get let's get a zine made with it let's get something going yeah that's good advice because i can completely understand the sentiment of like i need feeling like your project needs to be a finished product before mm-hmm. you can test it and you could run into a lot of issues of things that just don't they, they work on paper but they just don't work at the table yeah. Uh, and you wouldn't know that until you've spent how many hours mm-hmm. writing all of that material. Yeah, and the the number of things that I can go into my like friendly local game store and look on the shelves, and I know for a fact that they had smaller limited releases. Like w- you wouldn't know it unless you were in the design circles or or sort of like zine collecting circles or that kind of thing. But you look at things and you think a lot of these games, a lot of these big releases in the past couple of years all have been being tested behind the scenes for, for, for a lot of time and they've had like full PDF like not with, with less art, with less pages not as polished but they've been out there for a while like plugging away uh, and that's really amazing and that's something that I can take a lot of inspiration from that, that like I love the the sort of like the 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 I I, I love gaming as a hobby. Uh, I I don't I'm not as fond of gaming as an industry. Games industry I can take or leave the gaming hobby and people putting in their their own passion and and sort of like doing this because of the love of of the games that they're playing and and want to put their art out there. Um, I'm all over that. Well, and I think to your point with um, just game industry in general, part of that probably comes down to when you become so big that things are an industry or a business or something, then business decisions come first. And, you know, the other, the sometimes the fun and stuff can kind of go to the wayside because as as a business, your responsibility is to make money to pay your employees and, yeah. and everything. So, so yeah, it, there's definitely a balance there between being able to make money with the products that you have, but also having that like love for the game and the and the hobby at the same yeah. time. I, I think some sometimes uh, I, I know like uh, some people disparage hobbyists, uh, and it's hobbyist is always sort of looked down upon, and I I I, I think. It should be the flip to the other way around. I think the hobbyists are are often the heart and soul. The, the sort of the small indie developers are always pushing the envelope on our art form, and the big the big professionals are often playing safe because they they have to, like you say, it's their it's their livelihoods. Um, they've turned their their fun hobby into something they probably still find fun in a hobby, but also uh, it puts bread bread on the table. Um, you make a good point about hobbyists kind of pushing the envelope too, because it, it does sometimes seem like the little the hobbyist things 
uh, you'll have a really big hit with a certain, I don't know, maybe a certain product or a certain game or something, and then slowly some of the bigger titles will, you know, take that and be like, well, how can we kind of work that into our mainline product and yeah. and use some of the things that, you know, we would have never done because it would have been too risky as a big mm-hmm. company, but it turns out that people actually like that. So yeah. let's try to incorporate more of that. Yeah, like, uh, and this is in no way a negative, but it's interesting to see, like, Free League have got uh, sort of some designs going on that are, the the main sort of bulk of them seem quite trad, but they've brought in either narrativist and, and sort of narrative play elements, and at the same time brought in sort of OSR, sort of the OSR type feel to them as well and and, and sort of structures of play and then you get these sort of like uh, newer trad games that are that are bringing on some of these these sort of other parts that have maybe 10 15 years ago uh 20 years ago now just not been they were they were cutting edge and and kind of very fringe fringe gaming elements so yeah nice to see uh, um, I'm trying to think what else I've got going on at the moment. In the, I, I just thought of something quite near future that I think you'd be interested in. Um, that there's a, a a wee sort of charity convention running here in Scotland. Uh, but we're running. It's been run online called Albacon. Um, and it's raising money for uh, a local mental health charity called Penumbra, and they do sort of uh, advice and advocacy for folks with uh mental health uh difficulties and and needing uh, uh they just sort of need like advice support or or sort of like uh like some sort of advocacy so uh there's a local con running uh which, which you can look up called albacon and i'm going to be running one of my other games at that as well so yeah just popped into my head there. I thought I'd better mention it because it's it's coming up on the, the first weekend in October, so not far at all. Is there a website for that? Uh, Albacon dot something. <laughs> Give me a second. I'll, I'll have a look. <laughs> yeah, if you want to send that over, that'd be cool. Yeah, let me take a look. Let's see. Albacon dot co dot uk. There you go. Uh, and basically, it's like. There's a whole bunch of tables. It's pay to play, so you you pay for your slot at a game, uh, but the money goes into the the charity pot. And it's ran in past years, uh, and it's it's running this year. And I'm going to be running a different game from the ones I've mentioned there. One called Winter's Respite, which is um about another one of my dark, maybe darker, uh, although sometimes with a little bit of dark humour. Uh, sort of games, basically about you. You're all playing um, the young adults who are aspirants to be uh, sacrificed in a wicker man to bring back the sun. Oh, and interesting. It, <laughs> and it's it's not fantasy. It's modern day. Um, it's modern day horror. Um, but with there's no magic. There's no like. Elder Gods or Cthulhu or any of that stuff. It's it's literally just a bunch of young, like late teens, early twenty, very early twenties, uh, kids effectively, like in a lot of ways, like young adults though, um, jockeying to be the chosen, the chosen one to return the sun, and at the end of the game, the chosen one can, uh, can either. Can either uh, accept their fate and go into the Wicker Man, or they can end, take over the narration and end, end the tradition. And it deals with sort of like the sort of themes of it. It, it comes from growing up in small town Scotland, and so it deals with ideas about like being uh, having uh, like ideas of being closeted or having secrets or having these sort of like things that you've been taught a shameful and how those are revealed by the people around you or how those are kept by the people around you or used against you or and 
how that how that changes how your your sort of the social influence around that and the sort of like uh so how how that all sort of relates to one another and then culminates in 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 a wicker man being set alike. That's a that's a really interesting concept and and I suppose since it's I'm not as familiar with it, but just probably because it's not because it's more um, based around some of the stuff in Scotland than it sounded like. So I've had people who are over in the United States who I've played with, and then after the game, there's they talk about it in terms of it being really relatable, and folks from other parts of Europe, from further afield, uh, like folks from South America, and folks from like. Australia and New Zealand, thanks to the the, the power of the internet, um, I've play tested with folks from all over, uh, and they they uh, most of the feedback that I get is is pretty similar. That although I've written about it in a, a sort of Scottish context, that the the notion of small towns and the the way in which the communities function has a lot of similarities the world over. So well, yeah. I'm from a I'm from a pretty small town in Minnesota. So I maybe would um after playing it I maybe would feel the same way. I'll run a game for you if you like, or come along to Albacon, join the table, help out our local mental health advocacy group. Is that a, a digital con or is it yep. in person? We're doing it digitally because we're still in the middle of a pandemic. So that's, have a look. that's what I assumed. So yeah, yeah. Um, all, all I, I haven't, uh, apart from a very brief time where I've done a little bit of one-on-one skirmish war gaming for a little bit of time when it seemed like it was say, um, all my gaming for the past what are we close to a year and a half now? Um, yeah, a year and a half. It's all been online, and boy, uh, beforehand I, I would never have thought thought I'd have managed it but here we are i actually i don't know about yourself but i find like a lot of the i I, i've quickly upskilled on how to game over over the internet so i guess for me i um i work in the it world i do software development so i'm pretty up to speed on like on like software and stuff and using it, but I definitely mm. find myself going down the rabbit hole more so on things like maps and uh, audio and all of those other uh, things that can also come along with d- the digital experience that aren't as to do in person. <laughs> so it's it, no, it's just really I, like I would have sworn. A lot of my, I would have said a lot of my games just wouldn't have worked online. And I, I did say that. It isn't just, I think I would have, I, I definitely said, oh, this game would not work online. It just, it's, it's too much of a social experience. It's too, like, uh, I, uh, like just even the tactile and, and sort of use of putting tokens down in the middle of the table and that, that the way that focuses the game and the feeling of it. And I was like, you couldn't replicate that online. And, and some of it you can't replicate, but you can change and adapt and make it work. And and sometimes you can even make the game just work as well in a different way and provide a different experience. And uh, I've really appreciated um, uh, learning a lot about like running games and GMing games because of the, the sort of ways I've had to change up running games and playing games in the past year and a half. So, how do you run? Are there certain uh, sites that you use to run your games, or certain tools that you use for online play? I, I I'm I'm the I, I kind of go the other direction a lot with this. I I I don't really use any of the digital tabletops. I've used Roll Twenty a grand total of once. And I've vowed that if I can help it, I will never use it again. Um, and the others just don't appeal to me. I'm quite happy for whoever I'm playing with to be sitting with whatever dice that they need for play and just to roll dice and to tell me what the role is and us all to just be 
sort of like trusting that we're we're just rolling dice and seeing what's there and just use a a, a video conferencing or a voice chat like a VoIP service and sometimes I'll use a character keeper but that's just using Google Sheets or I'll use uh, I've actually used um, recently for Forged in the Dark stuff I've made up a couple of like um, little uh, whiteboard Google have a sort of whiteboard uh, thing going on and I've tried using Miro uh, and it works if I'm on a, a computer that's got a bit more oomph but on my, my old laptop that I'm on at the moment it, it chugs along so uh, <laughs> it, it, it's all right but it's hard it's harder to to use in those circumstances so I try and keep it as as low tech as possible and that kind of works out but I don't really play any games that use miniatures on a grid map or that kind of thing. I'm I'm very theater of the mind. So, uh, sure. So not having those tools isn't as big of a deal for exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 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 sure if it was if I was into games that needed that, I'd be looking at other stuff. But I I feel like it's it's been good that I I think the thing the the the, the adaptions I had to make are about like when you're playing online. I find that like having two characters or is is sort of like doing a thing is perfect because you've got like a little interplay and you can sort of swing the spotlight between little pairings and that works really well but even when you get up to three it can work with three pretty decently but as soon as you get into scenes with a lot more characters going on unless they are literally just meeting scenes where you're trying to figure things out it can become really complex really fast or somebody gets sidelined or you have to really all be working it really good if someone's a little knackered and falling out behind or somebody's knackered and is jumping in too much because of the the remote nature of it it's harder to to uh, to sort of rebalance so just how i how scenes get structured and the ideas I have for scenes just change based on that. Uh, and and so the the games that I'm playing as well, I've played a, a lot more sort of uh, two player games of late. So I think I played Break Up on Reentry recently, which is really good. It was a game about two mech pilots on either side of the uh, the the war between Earth and the colonies. Who are secret me secretly mech pilots, and the aces for the either side, but in their personal lives away from the front line, they're actually lovers, and they they go out on their final battle, and during that final battle, their identities are revealed, and what does that mean? How does it play out? And that was that was a really cool two player game, but um, yeah, played a lot more of those just because of the nature of internet play specifically like when you have a lot of people uh it's really difficult if everybody starts talking at the same time because you just you don't have that like spatial audio awareness when you're at a table where you can kind of listen to multiple conversations happening at the same time so that mm -hmm. can get really uh it can get really loud in your ears when everybody starts trying to talk at the same time and you really got to kind of pair down on like okay you talk you talk you talk and then we'll figure it out <laughs> yeah i find it really hard myself and i sometimes feel terrible because i'm sort of like what would be a sort of back and forth flowing way of communicating in person becomes a, a jarring cutting into pe other people's speaking way and i have to be really wary of that in myself probably done it with yourself on this call and uh yeah uh it's just yeah i i think it's like it's just such a, a a a different different environment and you don't have those those uh those sort of like cues from from your body language to fall back on i think you, oh oh go ahead oh, oh yeah well thank you see this is that that was it right there <laughs> i was i was sort of using my hands to gesture and thinking, and I, I, 
just went to speak and then obviously you went to speak. And, yeah, no, um, one of the other local club members, Dave Walker, uh, wrote an excellent uh, piece on, it isn't specifically about online gaming, but I think it re really helps when we're playing online, the, the types of advice, you know, uh, a GMing advice column that appeared in the Ed and Brandy Gamers theme. And I think it was also published on the, the Gauntlet blog. So you can find it in either of those places. And highly recommended for any, anyone on GMing, for GMing advice. It's some of the best GMing advice I've read in years. And it's about asking better questions and how to, to, uh, how to reconceptualize some, some, the, the sort of relationship between player, players and GMs in games that have a GM. Well, that's really cool. I'm going to have to look that up. I guess if people want to find me, uh, you can go to timeoftribes.com or uh, timeoftribes.itch.com or uh, at timeoftribes on uh, Twitter. Um, you can find me in those places. Oh, and, and uh, Instagram and uh, probably hanging out at your friendly local game store, trying to trying to put a free zine into your pocket. Oh, I didn't even mention. Uh, check out uh, anyone that's here. Check out that over November there'll be uh, Naga Demon, the the National Games Development uh, Development Month uh, that happens every year. It's been running for over the, uh, the past decade, and. Uh, I'll I'll chuck you a link about it, so rather than rabbit on about it, but that's another thing that I love doing every every year. So, so yeah, I will make sure to include links to your sites um, in the show notes. So if people are uh, wanting to head over there, there will be links in the show notes. Um, but yeah, otherwise, had a wonderful conversation with you. It's it's really awesome that we have the technology that I can talk to people from Scotland and halfway across the world, uh, as well as people from nearby. So definitely a lot of fun. I've, I've loved talking with you, Brock. This has been great. I, like I said earlier, I really enjoy your show and it's been really a pleasure for you to being on with you. I uh, loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Dungeon Master's Toolkit Podcast. You can find links to all of the products and resources that we talked about on the show in the show notes. And if you'd like to join the community or find out how to be on the show, check out our subreddit or join us in our Discord server.